Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. Woo! Tim Burton is back in full Tim Burton form, more or less, in the delightfully weird movie with the infuriatingly awkward title of Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, which, I'll tell you what, if you're going to rattle that off verbatim at the box office without having to check the marquee first, well, then you're probably a fan of the book or something. Now, I'm going to state right off the bat that this movie took me on quite a journey, so I'm just going to start at the beginning, okay? Which is slow, awkwardly paced, and dare I say, deadly dull. Asa Butterfield gives a pretty wooden performance as Jake, an awkward kid with a grandfather he loves, a mother who's barely there, and a father who he just sort of tolerates. Over the course of this movie, that's the kind of stance that we in the audience will be forced to take on his dad as well. Much like the Billy Crudup character in Big Fish, Jake's grown up hearing his grandfather spin incredible tales of peculiar children, such as an invisible boy or a girl who is lighter than air and who must wear shoes made of lead to avoid floating away. And they're all looked after at a school run by the entrancing Miss Peregrine, who has some peculiar abilities of her own. So think uh, X-Men meets Harry Potter, only weirder. Anyway, the first section of the film is borderline incomprehensible, with some clumsy exposition and even clumsier plot machinations that get Jake to cross over into a mystical land in the middle of Wales, where the aforementioned school and the aforementioned school mistress, played by the ravishing as ever Ava Green, are indeed real and under imminent threat. So you know what? I'm just gonna skip all that, because to be honest, this movie had lost me completely by the time it got Jake to that school. And even a few times afterwards, to be honest, it threatened to lose me along the way. We're what's known in common parlance as peculiar. It's a recessive gene carrying down through families. The problem with the film is that the entire mythology of its story is difficult to comprehend without some characters literally stopping the plot to explain it to you. My peculiarity. Because our abilities don't fit in the outside world, we live in places like this. To keep us safe, we create a time loop. The opening passages just sort of lie there from scene to scene as we see Jake deal with the death of his grandfather at the hands of some pretty terrifying monsters, and there's no real sense of direction or momentum. However, however, about midway through, everything began to change. Suddenly, the mythology started to get richer, deeper, and more exciting. The possibilities of the story became fresh and really inflamed the imagination. The acting by Butterfield, well, it doesn't get much better. But the new characters that get introduced, such as Emma, the aforementioned floating girl, are fascinating. The villains of the piece, who I won't reveal much about other than to say that one of them is played by a scenery-chewing Samuel L. Jackson, are downright terrifying. And you can feel Tim Burton slowly shaking off the necessary evils of book service and story mechanics and really starting to get all, uh, well, for lack of a better word, Tim Burton-y. And it only gets better, gets wilder, gets more gleefully convoluted as it races to its conclusion, to the point where, near the film's frenzied climax, I found myself literally on the edge of my seat, not really believing what I was seeing. I was enthralled, I was mystified. Oh, viewers, I was entertained. Terrifying monsters with tentacles coming out of their head, shapeshifters, stop-motion animated dolls fighting each other to the death, a little boy who was covered in bees. All of this thrown together with obvious glee by Burton, with a great Danny Elfman score by... What? What? Uh, oh, somebody else wrote it? Okay, uh, hold on, let me check my notes here. Oh, the score was written by a person named Michael Higgum and Matthew Margerson. Anyway, it's a lush and evocative score, and I felt appropriately carried away by it. Do all of the metaphysical and twisty turny elements of the plot make sense? No, not all. And there were quite a few of the children that I wanted to know more about and get to know better by the end. But there is no shortage of pure wonder on display here. Green and Jackson are clearly having a lot of fun with their parts, and there are some fantastical concepts on display. Some things you've never seen before that will alight your imagination and delight your senses. What we're left with here is a sort of muddled movie with a lot of great stuff in it. A lot of great stuff. So much great stuff that it definitely warrants a recommendation, and not even a mild one. I award it a medium bag of popcorn with a soda. Just one caveat, though. You've got to be patient. Because if you can plow through some of the clunky exposition at the beginning, you'll be rewarded with some truly fun, eye-popping insanity. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop. Click the icon right down there to visit our channel if you'd like to see more, and support us, please, by clicking subscribe while you're there, and by clicking the thumbs up icon below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children in the comments as well. Let's talk about it. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and that's my peculiarity.